thank you guys for coming out. We appreciate it. We want to thank the Metro. We want to thank Miller Lite. My name is Nick, senior staff writer here at Consequence of Sound. Uh, and Doomtree's here. Everybody, big round of applause. Basically, right from the start, this is a, it's a different kind of sort of music documentary than you're used to. It's not the kind of like, you know, we all met at this point, we all grew up at this point and got to here, and it's also not, you know, like Cocksucker Blues where you guys are, you know, doing coke in the bathroom and things like that, so, which is a good thing, I think. Um, that's part two. Okay, that's fair. So was that, was that a conscious effort on your part? How much say did you guys have in how this documentary was put together and what shots were used and things like that? We had a lot of say. Yeah. Um, we, had a, we had all the say. The, uh, <laughs> we had um, Chris, who is like a early 20s kid that we basically just like threw in the van. And we were like, all right, we want to make some promo videos. So every week as we're on this tour, we want to let people know what it's looking like. So originally it was just, we were going to make these three to four minute videos of just us hanging out on the road. Um, and as the tour got longer and he seemed to be pulling his weight and we got a Europe tour, it was like, well, we have so much footage, maybe we could do something with this. So at first it started like, here's all the footage. Just come with us to these festivals in the summer, come with us out to Europe and we'll see what we got when it's over. And then as he and his editor, who's also like a dude in his younger 20s, started really fucking with it over six weeks, it was like, you know, maybe we turn this into less of a, just a tour doc where we're hanging out in green rooms and more of a kind of just like tell the story of, of this crew and kind of how we are together and shit like that, so. It, really cool to watch because it's um, very much just about you guys doing it all yourselves. And what, like one of my favorite scenes is the section where you guys find out that the it's later on in the movie spoiler when you guys go alert. and watch it. Yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, before your New York show, there's the whole problem with water at the Bowery and everything. Okay, Sorry? It ends okay. I just oh, yeah. worried okay. faces. But when it, was, when it had flooded? Yeah, yeah. And then and it, it was, uh, you guys found that out. You went and did an interview or something, and the tour manager stepped in and was like, okay, here's what needs to happen. And then everybody just jumped into it. You know, people were barking out orders. You guys can do this. You can do this. Is, is, are there times where you get to the point where you're like, I just don't want to deal with this right now. Can, do you guys wish that you had somebody else there to do it instead of you guys? Or is, do you like having that control? We drink a lot of uh, airplane bottles of, of liquor on tour, kind of stashed strategically in pant pockets and stuff. But I think, I mean, it's, it's the double-edged sword. You know, with the, with the burden of the daily chores comes the control to make sure that those daily chores are managed well. Right. Yeah, and it was just, it was very impressive to see with you guys are like, okay, here's the problem, here's how it gets solved, boom, and then everything ends up being fine. Um, and that show did go well, you guys got it replanned and everything was great. We're lucky enough to have like a, a team who is just, works way, way harder than their pay grade, but um, it's a pretty small crew. You know, I would say we got a, a booking agent hustling hard, a couple cats who help us out, Ander, but it, we don't have 50 unless there's like 45 people I haven't met. Well, I got my staff. You got your staff? That's <laughs> fucked up. That's fucked up. That's fucked up. Uh, going with the different kind of documentary, there's not any huge sort of like explosion conflicts where it's you guys in a back room yelling at each other and things like that. Really the biggest conflict that it comes down to is you guys picking set lists really when it comes, and are there, were yeah. there other things that yeah, totally are there yeah. that weren't in the documentary? You guys made it. Yeah, there was a couple things. Uh, uh, a lot of it actually happened on the tour before. Um, the Wings and Teeth tour was a more uh, conflict-oriented tour. You know, <laughs> right. there was a time when me and Mike got in a shoving match at 9, 8.30 or 9 in the morning in front of a Starbucks in Virginia Beach. And we were just like <laughs> screaming the entire intersection of Virginia Beach. All the pedestrians had stopped and they were like, what are these crazy kids doing out here? Yeah, it blew up inside of the Starbucks and it moved, escalated out. And, and we didn't talk for like three days or something like that. We were arguing over uh, breakfast food versus coffees in the morning. Like why I always get to get coffee and he doesn't always right, get yeah. to get breakfast food. <laughs> I know we could get back into it if you want, but... Yeah, there was, like, there was all kind of like qu quibbling stuff like that, but this tour was a lot easier in some ways because there was two vans to keep the uh, parties separated. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like Mike is just gone. That tour also ended with all of us like crying to each other in a hotel room <laughs> on the last night of tour. We want to talk about conflict. Uh, 
Yeah, that was the resolution of that tour. That's what made the next tour happen. Shit too, because I fell asleep first. You were there for a second. You guys woke me up once, and I was on bed, and you're like, "We just talked about you for like 15 minutes," <laughs> and I fell back asleep. It ended in love, though. It ended in love. <laughs> I think I think that <clears throat> we were lucky enough to have something that actually was uh, enough material to make a product out of. At this stage of it, you know, through 10 years, there has been a lot of, you know. It's 10 years with your friends. You guys know what that's about. There's, there's always ups and downs. But we lucked out, and we had a really, really fun and kind of incredible year as a squad off, off the No Kings record. And we got a lot of opportunities we never had before, and we're able to capture most of them. So what, what's cool about it, too, is it's like more like um, about the life of what it's actually like. A lot of people are like, oh, that must be amazing. You get to do all this and this and this. And all that's true, but it's not very glamorous, and it's different than I think than a lot of people pictured it. It was different than I had pictured it when I was like 18. We're like, that is the best, right? And now, you know, not 18. <laughs> I'm 19, <clears throat> <clears throat> and uh, and uh, I've learned a lot in the last six months. <laughs> it's been great. So excellent. Yeah. All right, we're gonna open it up. Uh, does anybody have questions? You can step up to this microphone here. For the entire crew. Hi. Um, you know, uh, first off, I just really love your music, and I'm really inspired by it every time I listen to it. And I just wanted to say thank you for creating something like that. Oh, thanks. Um, and also, I just wanted to ask, like, you guys are talking about the intensity of tour and how, uh, like, creatively driven you all are, but how that can, like, really make you crazy in a way. Like, how do you guys stay grounded, and how do you guys stay in love with each other? If, like, do we do either? <laughs> I think it's it's like we said earlier. So, um, as far as staying in love with each other is, is, I think we've been through enough big hard shit in 10 years that at this point it's, you know, it's a little easier to let certain things slide and it's a little easier to not be so offended by certain things too. Um, as far as being grounded, being on the road and going home, is, it's, it's new every time. Every tour you're learning how to deal with being away from home. Every tour you're learning how to, you know, get along with people and, you know, pull your weight. So I don't know if there's anything that necessarily works every single time. Touring, you know, as grown-ups is probably a little different, you know, than touring, like, as, as teenagers in your early 20s. But I would also just say, like, there's at least two evenings of that tour and probably many more that I remember very distinctly, like, not being grounded or particularly graceful and accidentally acting like I was six years old for four or five hours. <laughs> and then, like, waking up and getting back in the van, like, I'm such an idiot, right? And, you know, that's just part of the deal, too. I'd say uh, it's it's patience, a willingness to adjust, and um, like being honest with yourself and being able to be honest with people around you and making sure that that's hilarious when you do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, like a sense of humor, being patient, and like making adjustments about your certain habits or whatever. Like, I'm gonna get coffee. I'm not adjusting to that. <laughs> <laughs> So Mike is gonna have to be willing to make an adjustment about it. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, anybody? Uh, so when you said you go, you originally started as a very like independently oriented writing group and then coming together collaboratively, what were the hardest things and the easiest things for all of you knowing each other so well, going from that very independent to very group collaborative uh, process? Uh, I know being a musician myself, it's really, really tough when you, when you find your one thing with one group of people and then you go off on your own and you do it for a while and then you try to go back to that and trying to find that healthy and happy ground because I realize writing kind of like posse oriented music like you said is probably not easy when you know you have your own music and you have your own style and your own way of doing things. I know for me it's uh, music then lyrics and then some people it's lyrics and music and sometimes it's just like fuck it throw it all together so uh for all of you uh what is the easiest and hardest uh things you deal with when you're doing that uh going from independent to collaborative i think the key to it for me is uh confidence in what my ability is and um confidence in my own voice and confidence in my not like my vocal voice but i mean like my my writing voice um and then being willing to kind of, like I have faith in that and I have confidence in that and I'm willing to kind of put some of my ideas to the side a little bit or know, it's, it's, it's like a lot of delicacy about winning, know, know when to take the lead and um, knowing when to kind of like fall back and let the other people play. 
And I think that all comes with confidence. And I think it all comes with like the, the trust in yourself that no matter what, you got your, you're gonna hold down your square and you're gonna make this song better <clears throat> no matter what. And I think that's what it is for me. I think the, the easiest part for me is, um, my, you know, I, don't, I don't produce. Um, although I kind of badly play at the piano, I can't like make a fully produced song musically by myself. And so the easiest part is hearing a beat, loving it, and then you know getting like the green light from one of the producers to work with it. Like yes, you know there's there's I've already accomplished in getting the permission to rap on something I could have never done by myself. The hardest part is working collaboratively as a writer. I I haven't figured out how to do that like in a way that feels. Or gonna get it's hard. It's really hard. Well, you know, and, and and side kind of sidebar to that. Do you guys end up ever writing things for each other because you just know, like, as you're writing along, like, I, if we worked in a different genre, we might do that more. Every once in a while, there's a line that we deliver, you know, where somebody else wrote to like kind of like orchestrated trades. So if I were a 16 and Sims were a 16, it's like make this more interesting than just like one voice, the other voice. You know, let's hype, let's trade lines, but you know, in 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 hip hop, that doesn't happen as much, you know what I mean, as it would maybe if we were working with another medium. For like from a production standpoint, I know that we went into that kind of like, we need to have a lot more different parts in each song so that there's room for five voices and it doesn't just get monotonous and it's not like a five minute song. It, got, it gets easier making songs with these people as we go because, you know, we all have a chance to go work out what we want to do. I think it's a lot easier making Doom Priest songs than it is making solo songs at this point for me. Just because I generally have confidence that I'm going to be inspired by what else is going on in the song and it'll make it easier to just kind of, it'll feel like whatever I'm coming up with is going to be good, you know? You know, I th I, that's how I feel about it. In solo songs, I sit and beat myself up. That's kind of true for me too, I think, that I, I feed off the energy and the creativity in the room. I feed off other people, like, you know. I feed off the, actually how fast they get their verse done. There's no way I'm gonna be the last one to get the, my part done. You know what I mean? So I have the thing. I'm like racing the clock. See, and that, and, uh, and that's the harder part for me too. Is the writing in a group is a lot of years just writing by myself, like unedited. There's no one there to like really tell you how to edit your songs or anything. But I think what's getting easier is when I write with people to be able to just let shit go. And like, for instance, like when I was writing for my last record, Steph gave me a chorus and. <clears throat> it just made sense immediately. Like I heard his voice as my voice, and yeah, I changed like a couple words, and that was it. You know, like I wrote some lyrics for his record to end a, like to end a verse. He's like, I need a line. He gave, four, he gave me a four bar at the end of one of the verses on Weird Friends, and then a two bar somewhere else on the record too. And at this point, it just makes sense because I'm trying to make a good song. Like I've spent years of writing like three pages of lyrics to a beat that was like a minute. <laughs> you know, and, like, and looping the beat, you know, and like, oh, this is my song now, or whatever. Uh, but like, that's, that's, that's the easiest part now is to, is to be able to let this shit go because I, I, I trust myself, I could write forever, but I trust them more for someone to say like, you know, that's enough or to give me a better idea. I think uh, the hardest part is, is to get in that mode because I'm so used to writing by myself. Um, I, don't, I'm not, I don't really feed off the competitiveness uh, or about like, uh, I don't know, it's, it's more, it's always just a feeling, you know, it's like, a, it's, a, it's always been a zone that I get into by myself, so try to work with somebody else, you just let it go. I feel like the way that No Kings work, like coming to the rapping was kind of organic in a way, okay, da da da, it was like that, but then we took all these kind of rough ideas that we had demoed out, and it really worked because uh, Cecil and Beak spent a ton of time in like the post-production of the record all right, this kind of makes sense here, but maybe we should move this part to this place. And so, I mean, I think the collaboration really never stops. And I think it's like a way to like, like I don't know, the way I kind of, <laughs> it's a really gross metaphor, I can't find a cleaner one, but you just kind of like barf, and then like kind of like go through it, and like, all right, that's good. And then like clean it up later, and clean it up later, but like get, get it out, you know, get it all out and don't stop. And then once you have like, enough material and then you kind of like sip through and find like the gold in there, you know? That's, that's actually kind of how we came about the beats to start with too, is since it was going to be a crew record, nobody was trying to like be the star of the song, even in like the, the beat phase, so, you know, Beak and me and Cecil would get together and have either some parts that we brought to the table, we'd work on it together. And, uh, 
I don't know, nobody's trying to be the star, everybody just kind of puts everything in. And then as the song is getting made, we pull stuff out as it doesn't make any sense anymore or add more stuff if we need it. Confession, I follow your band on Twitter. Um, and I guess what struck me about it was the fact that like your guys' tour, you know, you guys are kind of cramped in a van and you, you know, don't have necessarily the luxury of a bus, but as you sort of gain speed and gain popularity, do you necessarily concern yourself with how those kinds of amenities and that publicity and everything, are you concerned with how that could affect what people want to do with your music? Because I know as people kind of gain popularity, they can sometimes lose control. Where do you guys sort of stand on that and what do you sort of want for your next couple of years? I think one of the reasons why we've done it the way that we have, as far as all of us being the people who, you know, make, make the choices. Like, we it used to be, yeah, we, we want to make it exactly how we want to make it forever. And I think that until somebody offers us, you know, a perfect situation where we get to do all the things that we want to do, I think we'll probably do it the way that we're doing it and just get better at it as we go. I feel like we have, you know, a, a, a lot of releases now. Uh, and I think that we learn a little bit more about how to put things out every time we put something out. And it gets a little smoother, and it gets a little better. And I don't think that any of us are trying to do anything else at this point. I don't think that, um, that like, commercial success and popularity, like, definitively and necessarily, you know, have to come with, um, I don't know, phrases like selling out, you know? Um, so I'd say that, like, I'm, I'm ambitious and I want to go exactly as far as I can before I'd be asked to make any kind of compromise on artistic excellence or, you know, some degree of reasonable moral responsibility, I guess. Um, and after that point, I wouldn't want to go, right? But I'd be eager to push that ceiling as high as I could. We've always just worked really hard, so I know that with everything we get, we're really surprised. And we go to a back, you know, it's like, we know that we've earned it too. You go to a backstage and you're like, oh shit, there's water back here, awesome. <laughs> or like, oh, we got a sprinter van this year, awesome, you know, like, Oh, a tour van and a minivan? Right. Sweet. Like everything that we get, you know, we're really appreciative. And like, if it, you know, if we have two buses, it's like, oh my God, we have two buses. Then I know that we've probably worked really hard for that because we, you know, we're always willing to work really hard for everything. And that's how actually we like it that way. I think sometimes uh, we don't notice that it's going well until, you know, three months later on when we, when we get off tour or we get a break to like sit and look at how things are going. I think that there's too much work to do to like sit and stop and enjoy it. Often. I think the question was essentially like, are you, I know you tour really modestly, are you trying to stay that way? And we were like, well, the reason that we live so large is, <laughs> that's what we just did, that's awesome. We, I think we, we tour modestly because that's the way that you can do this and make money. You know, like, it, the, the more stuff you add, the less money you're taking home. There's a band I know, I'm not gonna tell you their name, but they have a $2,000 budget for catering every day, where there's $2,000 worth of private chefs that come in and cook them food backstage. And uh, I think that's the most like wasteful thing to me ever. And so I'm kind of like thinking about the fact that like, just because I have a show in Chicago this weekend doesn't mean I get a show in Chicago in six months. And I think that's kind of like the, the general way I live my life. Like every time I step on stage just could be my last time that I get to do this. And so I don't see the point in spending $2,000 a day on catering. That's like, to me, you know, $100,000 that you wasted this year on being an idiot. You, know? <laughs> you guys, through your music and attitudes, have always kind of uh, self-exiled yourself away from mainstream success. But it kind of it, it, it well, seems like mainstream now. success is on its way to finding you guys. And what, I, I don't want to repeat her question, but like, how do you guys plan on handling that? when it comes and what, how does Doomtree define success? And Steph, is it true that Kanye West has tried numerous times to sign you? I've heard that rumor. No, that's not true. What I worry about more is like what the fans are gonna do when like something happens that's awesome and then all of a sudden everybody's like, dude, fuck these guys. I was with them when they were talking about their minivan. Yeah. I, I, That's kind of what I am more concerned about is like, I don't know, we have like this crew of people now that we, I mean, we continue to like build and that's amazing, but we have this like kind of core of people that are around us and that are kind of like, 
there with us. And like to me, that's what's interesting about what we got. Then I think that what other bands that I know, like friends of mine, they don't have what that we all have is that we all kind of share this thing together. There's like it doesn't feel like a um, performer fan yeah. relationship, you know, like a weird like you're my fan because that that like thinking alone like bugs the shit out of me like you're my fan like that just <laughs> terrifies me as a person about who i become you know yeah, i, I don't think, like I it think we all have a kind of aversion to <laughs> <laughs> yeah me and my barbies so no but i mean i think that, that that might be a distinction right there is that like right there on face value like i don't like the idea of like you know fame and fan that like bothers me i think that that's true for everybody here yeah. But and that's they, more what I think about when it comes to blowing up or whatever. Yeah, I think we've all, the entire time, have been trying really hard to, you know, do this for a job. Meaning, if, if I could make a song that everybody in the world liked, I would be really excited that that happened. <laughs> there are songs out there in the world that I love that I think everybody loves, and those are, you know, amazing things. I don't... I would love to be able to do that. I don't think that any of us are trying to not be popular. I think that we've, I think that, I think that we've, oh, we've found, oh, shit. I, th I think we found, I think we found our audience by mistake, slightly next to what was going on. What I, I don't know why, but I feel like the the people who like us are down, and we're down for them, and it works out. But I think that it it happens. You know, we we look at what's going on in pop culture and, and in mainstream music like with our minds blown just like you guys just like what <laughs> I, I, I think that's true uh -huh. I think also I think if we if we were to you know reach some significant level of like you know commercial success in a mass market like I think we've already dodged a lot of bullets and that it took us so fucking long that like you're, you know, a lot of our formative adult years are just already over. So I think, <laughs> I think like if you get famous at 19, like you accidentally think you're the king shit, you know, you just think like this is real. Like I am this important, I think, you know? And, and I want a $2,000 catering budget and stuff. Whereas I feel like if, if there were a period for us to go nuts, I think we'd just have sort of calcified already, you know? So. I have one last request. I think this is something that you've started, and it's throughout the entire documentary. What is this, what is this sumo warm-up that you do before each show? <laughs> so I always wondered why sumo wrestlers did that. And someone's like, because it like helps your blood get moving or some shit. Like, you need someone to like, hold the microphone for you while you're I don't want to sit here and do I this I want right you now. to sit here and do this. But, uh, <laughs> But yeah, so I just did that. I don't know what the fuck. We just but started do you, doing it every do you night. Do you know what you're talking about? Do you guys see that in the documentary yet? Yeah. Is there? Okay, yeah. See, because I, I didn't. When I saw that, I wasn't like, oh, that's why sumo wrestlers do that. I had no idea that sumo wrestlers did that. So how did you even figure that out? I, I asked somebody. <laughs> that's not how we do it, you guys. We well, yeah, no. Like I just I took this big steps out of it and just went crazy down here. <laughs> Do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, that's where that came from. Big round of applause for Doom Three. We also want to thank the Metro. We want to thank Miller Lite for sponsoring us. Thank you guys for coming out to the Consequence Sound Top Sessions here with Doom Tree. Thank you guys so much. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you guys. Yeah.